Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, another HealthySimulation.com webinar in our webinar series. So excited to be participating in this week's Healthcare Simulation Week 2020 as well. We also have uh, World Patient Safety Day, which is this Thursday, September 17th every year, uh, organized by the World Health Organization and supported by a lot of uh, our media partners like the uh, Patient Safety Movement Foundation, uh, as well as uh, ISQUA and, and other uh, nonprofit organizations in the healthcare simulation space. So a lot of awesome activity taking place. So excited to have with us uh, Donna Prosser, uh, who is the Chief Clinical Officer of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. So Dr. Uh, Prosser has been in the healthcare industry for more than 30 years and is currently the, the CCO, if you will, of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, a wonderful organization that's doing some really amazing work in the patient safety space. Uh, she spent the first 15 years of her career at the bedside and transitioned into administration after a personal experience helped her to understand just how fragmented and unsafe patient safety can be. So that's really awesome to hear. I'm sure there's going to be some really important kind of uh, insights here gained from someone who has seen both sides of the equation when it comes to the healthcare process. And um, prior to joining uh, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, Donna uh, worked as a healthcare consultant helping organizations across the United States to improve quality and safety, increase patient engagement, and reduce uh, uh, clinician burnout. And so, um, you know, she's also served as a chief nursing officer. Uh, to improve uh, clinical practice across multiple healthcare systems. So really excited to have you with us here today, Donna, to provide us with this presentation, Safe and Reliable Care, How the Patient Safety Movement Can Help. I know there's some really exciting developments this week, both for the Patient Safety uh, Day, uh, Healthcare Simulation Week, but also with what Patient Safety Movement Foundation is announcing this week. So really excited to have you and to learn more. Great, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. So we'll just go ahead and get started right in this presentation, folks. If you're in the uh, live stream, please feel free to uh, ask questions there or in the uh, application for Zoom. I'll be following along and then we will uh, get those questions uh, asked. And uh, with that, Donna, thank you for uh, your presentation. Thank you. All right. Well, um... You know, uh, as, as, as Lance mentioned, I have been in this space for a very long period of time. I'm really excited to be now with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Um, we are um, we're a network of very passionate people around the world who are looking to improve patient safety um, because we know that we have a huge problem, um, both here in the United States and across the world. We know that hundreds of thousands of people die every year because of preventable medical error. Now, what that number is, it really kind of depends on, um, on which article you read. Uh, there are estimates of anywhere from 200,000 to 400,000 people dying every year in the U.S. alone. And, and the millions are harmed, we know, um, um, who may not necessarily die because of, of their medical error, but have life or, you know, life lasting results as, um, because of it. So, so we know that this is a huge problem um, in uh, it, and, and we've been and, and we've been talking about this for a really long period of time. Um, the estimated economic impact is tremendous. We know that we spend billions of dollars annually in the U.S. alone as a result of these medical errors. So you know it's definitely something that we have to improve. But I want to show you one of the reasons, you know, actually the reason why we exist here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. So a quick five minute video, um, just to kind of set the tone for why we're here and, and what we do, why we do what we do. Uh oh, Donna, it doesn't sound like oh. we've got audio there. So oh, it's, oh, here it's it Luke was a, a oldest child, we have two children. He was really a, a live wire. He was a very lively boy. He was also quite brilliant. I mean, he was one of the most highly intelligent people I've ever known. And he learned a lot. He knew a lot of things, more than, far more than most adults. So he had this sort of wide and varied knowledge. And he also had a wicked sense of humor. So he was, um, so other children really enjoyed him. He was just a fun kid. 
he had a condition called pectus excavata, which is um, a condition in which the breastbone doesn't really grow straight. It's just, it's a cosmetic condition. We saw an article in um, our local newspaper talking about this safe, minimally invasive new surgery. And we ended up taking our son for pectus surgery. And Lewis came out of surgery and we thought, we've made it through that. About three days after surgery, he, he suddenly had this excruciating pain in his upper abdomen. He was prescribed a, a, a drug called Ketorolac Tordol, which is um, an NSAID pain reliever, like aspirin. He developed a perforated ulcer because he wasn't properly hydrated at the same time. And no one noticed. He declined for 30 hours, and they dismissed it as uh, constipation. By the next morning, he had no blood pressure. He had um, sky-high pulse rate. He lost 2.8 liters of blood. And for a child size, I think he had had about four liters altogether. You know, I watched the, the the color drain out of his lips. It was just like water going down in a glass. And they turned the same color as his skin. Just all the, all the pink left his lips. It's, it's really hard to even imagine seeing something like that. And then he, you know, he, he said to me, it's, it's going black, and he, he went into cardiac arrest. You know, I ran out of the room. I thought he was having a seizure. I ran out of the room looking for help. These young residents and nurses were just astonished, and they worked on him for about an hour and a half before they gave up but uh, they never could bring him around. Losing Lewis has been devastating. I started Mothers Against Medical Error, and we came back from, from the hospital. The first thing we did was the legislation, the Lewis Blackman Act. So one of the things that we have tried to work on is you know, full disclosure, informed consent, transparency, badges, labeling of people, because we had been misled about who was a resident and who was a doctor, and rapid response, having an emergency number for people to call and allowing people to call their doctors as well. So those were four things that had come directly from our case that, um, you know, that we had seen that we thought we could fix with legislation. Lewis was monitored, but it kept alarming and they would keep setting it lower and lower. And finally they had it down at 85 and he, it still kept alarming. So they turned it off. Every patient deserves continuous monitoring. You, you never know what's going to happen, particularly with post-operative patients. Um, Lewis is a prime example. He was a perfectly healthy child, which is why no one believed that he could possibly have anything wrong with him. Um, so you need a, um, an objective observer like a monitor. So um, thank you for indulging me in that. And, um, and, you know, keep in mind, when we talk about how many hundreds of thousands of people die every year because of medical error, there are faces just like Lewis behind every single one of those, those names, you know, and, and Helen Haskell has been a, a, a voice in the industry for many years, ever since Lewis passed away. 
because patient safety is not a new conversation. We've been talking about this for quite a long period of time. As a matter of fact, if you look in the literature, it was really in the 1960s that we began looking at um, you know, how medical error occurs. And, um, but it, re it really didn't, the, the movement didn't really take off until the early 1990s. And so we had pioneers like Lucian Leap at that time um, who estimated in 1984 that 180,000 people die every year because of medical error. And he was one of the first people to equate that to three jumbo jets crashing out of the sky every day. Um, and, and suggesting that we need to look at our systems, not at individual mistakes as a root cause for solving some of these medical errors. But again, you know, Lucian talked about this in 1994, that if, if three jumbo jets were crashing out of the sky every two days, there would be a public uproar of, uh, and the, the aviation industry would be expected to explain themselves. Um, but, you know, it's a little bit different in, in healthcare. So, you know, Lucian and a lot of his other, uh, the, the other initial founders of the quality and safety movement were doing a lot of great work, but the general public hadn't really heard a whole lot about it until 1999. Now, in 1999, the Institute of Medicine released its, its landmark report to Air is Human. This is the one that said between 44,000 and 98,000 people die every year because of preventable, preventable medical error. Now, the difference here is that this actually got leaked to the press. So all of a sudden, it got the notice of the general public and of the, uh, and of the United States government. Um, so, but it's important to remember, too, that that particular report was only looking at errors of commission. In other words, if we omitted a, a treatment that ended up in, um, in, a, in, ser in serious harm, it wasn't counted as one of those errors. So we know that even in that report, that's a, that estimate was likely quite low. And then in 2001, they, I, the Institute of Medicine followed up with a, a blueprint of sorts, you know, a roadmap for us to say, all right, it's the 21st century, we have to be different. We need to make care safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable. So that ushered in a decade of change. Those of you who have been in the quality and safety space for a long time know what I'm talking about, that you know, for the, the first decade of the 21st century, we did a lot of work. There was so much more focus on performance improvement in hospitals. And you know, we started learning all kinds of different terminology and lean methodology and Six Sigma and using, using different terms like DMAIC and PDSA. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement, they, they had the 100,000 Lives campaign, which was followed by the 5 million Lives campaign, trying to, um, you know, to do whatever we can to improve those, those processes so that we can reduce medical error. Um, suddenly, reporting data on a public basis became quite the thing. Um, you know, so we started sharing our core measures online with, with the government. Um, and, and of course, this led to a desire to no longer hide the information that we have, you know, it was no longer proprietary information, how to take care of patients safely. We began sharing this learning using collaboratives with each other. Uh, disease specific certifications became quite the thing um, in, in, in that period of time because it became important that we improve quality and safety outcomes of those particular uh, areas where we knew that reimbursement was really going to be significant. So a lot of us began having um, oncology, cardiology, and, um, and, 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 and cardiac disease-specific certifications so that we could maximize our, um, our outcomes in those areas. We also began implementing electronic health, medical, or health records or electronic medical records in an effort to improve coordination and collaboration. Um, and then HCAP scores, they started in 2005 and other areas of the world. Um, we also started tracking patient satisfaction scores. And then at the end of the decade, of course, we had in 2010, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Here in the United States, this is the first time that an organization's financial outcomes were tied to their, uh, their, those publicly reported metrics that we had been talking about for a couple of years. But then here we were back in 2010, uh, met, you know, the Office of the Inspector General looked at Medicare beneficiaries and found that we were still looking at 180,000 people dying every year because of preventable medical error. 
So at the end of, of that first uh, decade of, of, of trying, our founder, Joe Kiani, said there has to be something that we can do. There has to be a way that we can, we can help make this better. And so he founded the patient safety movement back in 2012 um, you know, with, with the, the very ambitious goal of eliminating preventable deaths in hospitals by 2020. And in 2013, we developed the first of what we called our Actionable Patient Safety Solutions, or APPS. And what these are is a, uh, an evidence-based summary of all of the best practice guidelines that are out there. And they're, they're available for free on our website for any hospital um, to download. And one of the things that Joe was very famous for talking about was saying, we can no longer hope for zero. We have to plan for zero. And we can only do that if we're doing it together. And so... He invited everyone that was passionate about improving patient safety to come together in a global network. And in our network, we invite patients and families, hospitals and healthcare systems, partners from all different uh, uh, organizations that are, that are interested in healthcare, healthcare technology companies, and, and legislators as well. So our patient and family advocates are absolutely the heart and soul of what we do and why we do it. Um, you know, you heard the story from Helen, you, you can find on our website any number of stories like that to, to help to remind us of why we're, we're doing this very important work. Because every one of us at some point is going to either be a patient or, uh, or have somebody that we love be a patient. From 2012 to 2020, we, uh, we had four, more than 4,700 hospitals who committed to patient safety with us. And together we tracked that by implementing new improvements like the ones that we talk about in our apps, these hospitals saved over 366,000 lives during that period of time. Some of our hospitals, we called five-star hospitals because they committed to every single one of our apps to to improve all of those different populations in their organizations. We had more than 90 partners that joined us to, to help be, and, and to formally state on our website exactly what it is that they're gonna do to improve patient safety. We also talked with technology companies because healthcare technology companies very often in the past were collecting a lot of patient data but then charging organizations to share that data with them. We have more than 90 hospitals who have signed an open data pledge and committed to not charging for the patient data that they're collecting on their devices. And of course, policymakers. We, um, you know, Joe, Joe knows a lot of people, and so we were able to, to create a network, uh, a global network, that in, included some of the, the most well-known politicians in, in the world. And as you can see, our network expands across the globe. We, are, we have more than 60 countries who have partnerships with us. So after all of this time, after 18 years of working with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and after more than 20 years of dedicated effort by healthcare professionals everywhere, where are we? Well, obviously we did not achieve our, our goal of zero harm by 2020 um, because millions continue to die every year. And if anything, this COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted that patient safety still remains a huge problem for us, um, especially for our health workers. And it's one of the things that we are focusing on this World Patient Safety Day on Thursday, September 17th with the World Health Organization is both health worker safety and patient safety, because you can't have one without the other. So why haven't we fixed this? Why have we been working so many years and so hard and, and we still haven't gotten to the point where we have safe and reliable healthcare systems? Well, the first is just, the, it's just our culture. It's the way that we look at how people make mistakes. We in healthcare, um, you know, we have a very hierarchical system, a very paternalistic system where, you know, we don't, ex we do not tolerate people making mistakes. And so, um, rather than identifying systems and processes, people are looking for who it is that we need to blame, which then makes people afraid to speak up and to admit when they have made an error. We also have been talking for a really long time about the importance of patient-centered care. But really, in reality, our care is pretty clinician-centered. It's, it's focused on the needs, the needs and the efficiency of clinicians rather than those individualized needs of every patient. 
And in the meantime, over the last 30 years, as we've been working to improve quality and safety, our care environment has become more and more complex as patients become sicker and sicker. And because we have been working so hard to improve quality and safety, all of those processes that we've been put into place over time have made almost a patchwork quilt of improvement that has made it really hard for the front line to, um, to simplify care processes. When we look at uh, patient care, we, you know, we, we know that we have gaps in, in the way that patients are, are cared for across the continuum. Care coordination is, is something that is very hard for, for organizations to do because there is no one person who follows the patient across their entire uh, care journey from the beginning to the end. And so we need, you know, we, we, we definitely are lacking processes that help to improve coordination and collaboration. We've, even though we've been working very hard on improvement and, um, and you know, those of us who have been in, in healthcare for a really long time know a lot more about performance improvement now than we did 20 years ago. But that improvement has often been implemented in silos. So, you know, I like to say the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is improving. And that has also created confusion in some organizations. And sustainability is much harder than any of us realized. You know, we, you know, in the beginning, we were like, oh, we can fix that process. That's easy. Yes, we will change that process to do X, Y, and Z. We put it into place. And then all of a sudden, here we are six months later, and nobody's following X, Y, and Z anymore. Um, and then we scratch our heads and wonder why. So, um, and then the reason why is because it's really, really hard to do. Um, and, and, and in the midst of all of this, most healthcare organizations today are struggling financially. I mean, with the exception of our for-profit hospitals and our very large systems that have a, a good deal of money, you know, most of our smaller healthcare organizations are not that flush. And so there isn't a lot of excess cash uh, around to dedicate towards improving quality and safety. Another problem is that the public is generally not aware that this is a huge problem. Now, at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, a few months back, we polled a thousand folks in the public and compared them their answers to those in our, our network, in the community that, uh, that knows that patient safety is a problem. But 91% of the public that were polled said that they'd heard either very little or nothing about medical error in, um, in, their, in their region or their state. So this is a huge, a huge reason why I think if people, if 91% if, if of the public knew how much of a problem patient safety was, they would be demanding answers. So what do we do? How do we, how do we improve this? Well, it, the patient safety movement, we're still planning for zero that we just because we didn't get there yet doesn't mean that we are not going to continue to strive for zero. So this year in 2020, we renewed our mission and vision. And now our, our new vision is zero preventable deaths by 2030. Um, and but we have expanded our mission, we are no longer focusing just on hospitals, we're looking at healthcare across the continuum. And also not just focusing on death, but we want to eliminate all harm from preventable medical error. And so we have nine strategic aims for how it is that we want to get, we're, we're going to get there. As I mentioned, prioritizing our patients being at the center is one of, is a core value for us here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we know that we have to promote transparency and we have to get everybody uh, involved in improving this problem. We have a strategic plan that is focusing on, number one, improving our impact. We are a nonprofit organization. We rely on, on donations. And so that is a, a huge issue for us. If we want to continue to help, to help folks for free, then we need the funding to do so. As I mentioned, we need to generate awareness out there in the, in the, in the world so that people know that uh, patient safety is a problem. We'll work with legislators to see what we can do to, uh, to improve transparency and aligned incentives through legislation. Our partnerships are still very important to us. We want to increase the number of hospitals that are making commitments and continue to increase the number of partners that are joining us in this effort. And then finally, providing solutions, those actionable solutions that organizations need to truly improve. 
And so what we what we really need is to help organizations to become these highly high reliability organizations. We've been talking about this for 20 years and, and quality and safety as well. Um, back in 1990, Carlene Roberts had this definition that HROs, high, high reliability organizations, are, are those organizations that have been able to operate nearly error free for very long periods of time. Again, this is not something that, um, that we can claim in healthcare. Um, and I think it's really interesting that we that this has been optional up until this point. And, um, and so a goal for us at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation is to help organizations to make this no longer optional. We have to improve the reliability and the safety of the care that we provide. Now, one thing that we have, um, we have come to find out over the last 20 years is that if we want to improve the population specific care that we've been focusing on, for example, in oncology, in cardiology, in sepsis, if we want to improve those population specific components of care, then we've got to have a solid foundation from, from which to practice. In the past, we relied on champions to get us uh, to, to develop improvement in those areas. So for example, in oncology, perhaps there was one particular oncologist who was championing a cause to improve processes and quality in that particular program. And those, those changes may sustain because those individuals are there to champion the cause. But when those individuals leave, that's when we see difficulty with sustaining. And that's why we're suggesting that we need these three components to make sure that our improvement is not relying on these champions and these heroes that we have in healthcare. We need a person-centered culture of safety, a holistic continuous improvement framework, and an effective model for sustainment in order for any change to, to continue. And so what I mean by this is, you know, in organizations that have a true person-centered culture of safety, those organizations make sure that safety is, is a priority for every person that enters the organization. And so here I'm not just talking about patients and families, I'm also talking about every clinician, every administrator, visiting physicians, vendors, visitors, everybody that's coming into the facility. We need to be looking and, and focusing on the patient or the safety of every one of those persons. And then of course, that also means patient-centeredness and patient-centered care. Um, we have to engage our patients and families in improvement activities. We need to ask them, is, is the care that we think that we are providing actually what you're receiving? And then creating those care systems that are well-coordinated and individualized for our patients is critical. Now, in order to do this, we have to hardwire transparency, respect, and, tr and trust throughout the organization, from the front line to the boardroom and everywhere in between. If there are nurses who are afraid to speak up and, and, to, and to challenge a physician in a respectful manner in the organization, then that's a culture, a culture change that has to happen before any improvement is really gonna be able to take place. Organizations need to, uh, in, in, as well as being transparent across the organization, be transparent with individuals when errors occur. Uh, there is a program called CANDOR through the AHRQ that walks organizations through how do you discuss errors with patients and families in an open and honest way. And then finally, adopt a, adopt a just culture approach. How do we know whether or not the reason why an error occurred was because of an individual mistake or because of a system or process issue? Generally speaking, it's a system or process issue, and we need to get to the root cause of it. Lucian Leap said back in the 90s that the single greatest impediment to error prevention in medicine is that we punish people for making mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, and we have to identify when those human errors occur. Now, this, the second core component of having this solid foundation for safe and reliable care is a holistic continuous improvement framework. And what do I mean by that? I mean that we are approaching continuous improvement as an entire organization from a system approach. So we don't have pockets of improvement happening throughout the organization and every department didn't choose their own way of figuring out how that improvement will happen. 
you think about how many different types of vocabulary we now have in organizations. Those of us that were trained as clinicians were trained on the scientific method and the nursing process as problem solving methods. But then we met engineers and lean improvement specialists that brought in PDSA and PDCA and DMAIC and Six Sigma. And now we have all of these different acronyms and all of these different ways of saying the same thing. And that is very confusing to people. Words mean a lot and we have to be very consistent about the way we talk about improvement across the organization. And all of the improvement work needs to be coordinated and at a singular level because, you know, all of these improvement teams, regardless of where they're working, are competing for the same resources to make their, pro their projects happening. They're competing for, for, uh, informatics, uh, for the informatics department to build something into the electronic health record or to build something into a policy or to create a form or to create a, a, an educational module for the team so that they know what the changes are. And so all of this effort needs to be coordinated across the organization so that we are not competing for each other's attention and resources. And then looking at our data and, and the integrity of our data. If, if, uh, if we're not using technology to maximize our efforts with with managing data, then we're probably missing a lot of things. And there's still organizations today where, where, um, where, where our metrics are, are hand calculated in some cases. So we need to maximize the use of technology to collect data, to validate data, but then also to share the information about how all of that, that works together. Leaders should be able to see how the improvement in one area is also impacting the improvement in another area. And so, so using that data to provide information in the terms of, of charts and graphs to leaders is very important. And we need to make sure that it's easier for the frontline to know what to do. So you think about, think about all of the information that the frontline needs to be able to take care of patients. When you're creating simulations and your educational opportunities, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about here, right? There's, and it depends on who the, the team was that came up with the processes for this particular uh, diagnosis or, 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 uh, or department. So there are, it, it could be that there are policies or procedures or protocols or order sets, or maybe it's a memo or somebody, somebody just posted a word document on, you know, in the bathroom so that everybody could see it. There's a million places where the clinicians need to look to be able to find out what it is that they need to do. And part of this continuous improvement framework needs to be having a clear process for touching every single one of these documents and making sure that they are very clear and easy to follow and easy to find. And then sustaining. Um, you know, again, it's the bane of every healthcare administrator's existence. How do we make this improvement effort stick? So again, I suggest that we look at integration of all of our efforts across the organization. If, if the front line has 16 different computer-based modules that they have to do every year and two different uh, skills fairs that they have to go to and all of these other different in-services and such, if they're just going through the motions to get those things off of their list, then you can imagine how these things are not going to sustain. This behavior is not going to change over time. So look critically at what is it that you're doing in terms of communication versus education, because they're two very different things. If, it, if you want to communicate something, make sure that you have very creative networks um, that have multiple opportunities to get information to, to people across your organization. And then if you truly are going to be doing education, again, make sure that your education department understands all of the efforts that are happening out there with education so that they don't, so that there isn't a frontline clinician someplace who may be getting, who may have three different modules that have conflicting information in them because three different people wrote those modules. Focus on de leadership development. Organizations that are highly reliable know that leadership development is critical. And that also means looking at their workload. Do they have the time that they need to be able to effectively hold their frontline accountable and to effectively lead improvement? Do they have those skills? 
So, so focus on, on, on leadership development there. And then, of course, understand the impact of, of human factors. Everybody in the organization needs to understand what that means. You know, what, what is, how do human people behave? And what is, how does that impact change management regardless of how it is, how it is occurring? So as James Reason said, we cannot change the human condition but we can change the conditions under which humans work. And that's what we advocate for here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. We cannot continue to do things the way we've been doing them for the last 20 years and expect to get a different result. We have to change the way we are looking at quality and safety improvement moving forward. And we are here to help organizations to improve. All of our resources are free. We have um, many networking opportunities that uh, we used to have, uh, but in the face of COVID, those are now virtual. Um, but uh, on our website, you can see we have patient stories to engage and get people interested. There are plenty of blogs and articles and videos and webinars. As far as we're concerned, we have two very distinct um, audiences. We have patients and families in the general public who may not have this speak the same language as the the healthcare professionals that we do and then we also have have our clinicians and our administrators and we have resources for them to improve care in in hospitals and healthcare organizations we have um, a couple of very uh, great pages on um, covid 19 resources so excellent resources there for you we've expanded our actionable patient safety solutions and i'm going to talk more about that in just a moment we also have two mobile applications. One is called Patient Aider, which is patient education uh, information, and, um, and also our patient safety solutions is our, our apps blueprints that are, are available on, uh, on a mobile app in addition to being able to download online. And you can access all of this, again, for free under patientsafetymovement.org. Again, our expanded uh, actionable patient safety solutions include one, blueprints. Oops, one I'm sorry. Question. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. One quick question from Diego, Donna. Um, is the patient safety uh, movement foundation focused on patient safety primarily in the United States, or does it have international resources and support and kind of what's going on internationally for the organization too? No, that's a really great question. Um, yes, we are a global organization, um, and um, we are based here in the United States, but our focus is improving is improving globally. And so um, we are also in the process of creating a Spanish library of all of our actionable patient safety solutions as well. Awesome, thank you so much. Great. So our actionable patient safety solutions include three different components. There are what we call apps blueprints that used to be that, that, uh, that evidence-based summary that we that, I, that we've always had, of, uh, but that, that now includes a few more things. Now it has a clinical workflow and a performance improvement plan, or a performance improvement plan in each of those blueprints. Um, we are about halfway through updating all of our apps to include these. By the end of the year, we will have uh, incorporated them into all of our apps. Um, our educational resources we now have available on our, libra on our uh, 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 educational library that's on our website, and you can find um, all of these resources there. And what we've just started offering um, effective now for anybody that is in our network is free virtual coaching. So if you're a, if you're a healthcare organization that doesn't have the endless funds to hire very expensive quality and safety consultants to come and help you with performance improvement, let us know. We're, we're here to help you with that as well. Um, and so there's many things, many things that you can do to get involved with us. Um, I think the most important thing is that we all have make a commitment to a personal shift in awareness. Those of us who are in healthcare, um, you know, we, we need to be aware of the patient safety issues that we have and to, and to make a commitment that we're going to change the way that we focus on on healthcare moving forward. Help us to build momentum for patient safety by joining the movement. If you can, if you can join on behalf of your organization, great. If not, join, for, join yourself. And, and there's plenty of ways that you can get involved. Um, help us to plan for change, not just hope for change. Uh, if you, again, if you can, uh, you know, if you have the ability in your organization, then you know, talk to whomever you can in your, in your institution to help them commit to zero harm. 
We're looking to help legislation for various uh, activities, including patient safety boards. We'd love to see, just like we have a National Transportation Safety Board in aviation, we'd love to see something like that in countries to, to be able to examine when patient errors occur. Um, and then donate, please. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization, so please donate so we can continue to help patients, families, clinicians, and administrators with the free resources that we have. If you are a, uh, in the position that you can make a commitment on behalf of your organization, then please do so. Those organizations who make a commitment to establishing a safe uh, and reliable care foundation are eligible for free coaching. Um, if your organization has not made a formal commitment, we are still here to help you at a nominal fee for our coaching. But um, you know, if, if you commit to sharing your serious safety event and near miss event data with us next year, uh, then, then this coaching is free. And then of course, Thursday is our um, big day, World Patient Safety Day. We have an event just, uh, and, and so do most quality and safety organizations across the world. Our event begins at 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Thursday, September 17th. It's about a three-hour event that will be live streamed on YouTube. We would love to see you there. Um, it, it, this also is free, so please uh, RSVP and Unite for Safe Care um, on our website. So, uh, awesome. Lance, that's everything I have for you today. I assume there must be some questions I can answer. Yes, absolutely. One from the audience here. Do you think that having so many different organizations involved in patient safety in the United States works against patient safety in the U.S.? I guess that's in relation to there just being a lot of different uh, groups. I know IHI, for example, I believe acquired or kind of merged with uh, the patient's uh, NPSF, yeah. right. And yeah. And so, yeah, I guess, what do you think about the different groups and organizations? Um, is that hindering us in any way? No, I think, um, I think it's a great uh, illustration of how improvement has happened over the last 20 years. Right. I think in 1999, when I know, I know I, along with a lot of other people said, Oh my gosh, you've got to be kidding me. We had no idea that this was such a problem. And so we just started fixing we just started saying, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? Um, so I think we're all moving in the right direction. I think there are some things that some of us offer that others don't. And we are now learning how we can work collaboratively there. Um, there's been a lot of effort um, uh, on, on the part of many of the organizations to join forces. So you'll notice that our event on Thursday is co-sponsored by ISQA um, as well as Leapfrog Group. Um, we also work very closely with um, the um, National Association of Healthcare Quality. And on Wednesday, we are co-convening with them at their annual uh, event so that we can have, they're dedicating one whole day of their annual conference to patient safety. And we're working with them on that content. So I think, I think you're going to see a lot more of that collaboration among patient safety organizations moving forward. That's fantastic. And I know that, for example, there are, in the simulation world, there's groups like the Global Network for Simulation and Healthcare that are working to kind of be a think tank for the, um, the various organizations in the space. And so I think, you know, the more the merrier in terms of expanding these conversations. And each group has, you know, its own kind of focus and capabilities and strengths in terms of uh, ways to engage and support the community, one of which I think is so unique for the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And if you wouldn't mind maybe going just a few slides back, Donna, to talk a little bit more about this uh, coaching program. What is the commitment that is necessary um, in terms of, you know, um, being able to gain access to that coaching? And then what does that coaching itself entail in terms of the support that these groups can start to kind of um, rely on the Patient Safety Movement for in terms of the support? Absolutely. Well, um, so in order to, now we'll, we'll provide the coaching again to anybody. Um, and if you think about, you know, what you would get from an ordinarily, ordinary uh, consulting firm, we would help organizations to, and I'll actually go back here so you can see my list here. So the first thing that we need to do is, is help with an assessment of what your current state is, help you analyze your data and look at your current processes. We, um, or I, I would in my back in my consulting days, I would come to your organization and we would map out current state and things like that. We can't do that in a pandemic. 
but we have figured out how we're going to do this virtually and help you um, to map out that current state, identify where your gaps are, and then prioritize what it is that you need to do to, to meet your goals that, uh, that your organization has determined. Most organizations have so much to fix that it's not going to happen all at once. So we're going to help you to, to put a process in place for performance improvement for now for those things that are important to you, but mostly also help your teams to learn how to do this performance improvement so that you can continue to apply that to your strategic plan over time. Now, in order to, do, to get this for free, all we ask is that organizations make a commitment to zero harm. What that means is that your CEO and your senior leaders have said, yep, we agree that having a person-centered culture of safety, a holistic continuous improvement framework, and an effective model for sustainment are a priority for us moving forward. And we are going to do everything that we can to improve that foundation so that we can reduce our, uh, our events of harm. All they have to share with us are their serious safety events and their near miss events for the year. And because what we wanna be able to show people is that with, with a focus on, on, on establishing this foundation, organizations are able to make a true, a true difference. And what we should see is that serious safety events go down and near miss events go up over time. Right. And so for the, it seems like those organizations that want to be forward facing towards the patient safety concept and, and roadmap that want to, or are already committed to these types of outcomes and that are willing to go a little, uh, into a kind of, um, slightly more, um, uncharted territory in terms of releasing those, uh, records and getting them out there. Um, are those things identified with regards to individuals and actual moments of, 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 of error or is it more about like system-wide issues that are being reported? Yeah, we don't want any I, patient, uh, you know, associated data. We just want global numbers. So we just want to be, you know, if, if there were an organization who said, we would love to have free coaching from you, then we would say, excellent. Let's find out what you, where you're at right now, what's your baseline for serious safety events and near misses, and then give us that number again at the end of the year so that we can help to show improvement. That's all we are interested in. And I think, yeah, right. So, so making it so that we're not getting the nitty gritty, but rather looking at the bigger picture here and trying to start making some kind of uh, larger uh, brush strokes in terms of an understanding of what's going on with that particular institution so that we can use that and correlate it with not only the work that you all are offering in terms of the support, but also to better understand the metrics of what's going on in this space. It does sound like a lot of the terminologies that, you, that you've been utilizing, Donna, relate back to the aviation industry and the way that it handles um, near-miss events or, or errors, right? We've had recently uh, the two Boeing uh, 737 MAX crashes that led to an international shutdown within a month of right. the use of that plane right and so i think in that space we've got things like the ntsb we have things like the uh, the faa we have international um commitments to or standards with regards to communication through crm and you know just quite frankly like even a baseline common language utilizing english for all ground control uh, or, or radio-based discussions right between various agencies. Do you think that uh, we, we are in the long run trying to utilize some of those same tactics that have worked so well in aviation and, and translate them into the healthcare space? And, and, and does that even work? And, and obviously there's some differences. What do you think those differences are? How do you think we overcome them? And I know that's a grandiose question, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> it's one that I, I, I am so passionate about in terms, of, in terms of understanding where can we learn from groups that have gone forward and, and achieved the goals that we want. And I think that aviation is a perfect place to, to do that, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, we agree. We agree 100%. Um, you know, again, if you look at those organizations, those, those industries that are considered highly reliable, you know, the nuclear power industry, the aviation industry, you know, space, I mean, they can't afford to make mistakes. And we can't afford to make mistakes in healthcare either. But because we, because our product is different, because our product is human beings, there's almost a sense in healthcare that 
medical error is just a cost of doing business. And so, so I think that's what really has to shift. We're, we're all in agreement that we can learn from those organizations by, by using checklists, by focusing on, um, you know, standardization and, and by, uh, by, you know, validating um, that, you know, it, by measuring all the time, we don't measure all the time in healthcare. We measure until we see an improvement, then we stop measuring that thing and move on to something else. They don't do that in aviation and nuclear power. So there's a lot that we can learn from those organizations. We would love to be able to see that we have a national patient safety board similar to the NTSB. And that's something that, that a lot of patient safety organizations are a proponent of. Um, we are years away from something like that, I think. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely like a long-term discussion. Yeah. Another question that's come up here, do, do you all see that uh, countries with centralized healthcare systems have better outcomes when it comes to patient safety or these types of initiatives, say, for example, the UK or Australia, where we might have more social uh, democracy type uh, government situations uh, in some sense, like an NHS or those types of things? That's a really great question. And the answer is really no. I mean, there, there are, uh, you know, some of the, it depends on the error, right? So in, in, in the United States, sometimes we have errors that occur because of lack of access, because somebody doesn't have insurance. And so, you know, perhaps that means they were misdiagnosed, not because of an, uh, of an error that occurred with a particular individual, but because of their particular insurance situation. Now that doesn't happen in those, org in those countries that have uh, universal access to healthcare. However, we all have the same culture, right? You think about where did, where did the culture of medicine come from? Over time, you know, we, we came out of both the military complex as well as out of the religious complex. So, you know, perhaps it was the Catholic church who was running a hospital um, or, you know, or it was, as I said, the military. You think about the language that we use in terms of a charge nurse and a chief of staff, right? It's no wonder that we have a very paternalistic view in medicine, a very top-down view. We've also been, been taught that our individual practice is very important and that I as an individual practitioner need to be concerned about the ethics of my care. And so we are not necessarily taught that, that healthcare is a team sport. So, um, so there's, a lot, there's a lot to do in the culture of healthcare in general across the world and in, in um, you know, just looking, looking at those opportunities to change our culture deep, deep down that are what needed to need to happen in order for us to change this. Yeah, having done some interviews with folks in the aviation industry who have seen that transition into simulation mandates and, and black box technologies for recording everything that goes on and all these the crew resource management uh, communication practices, you know, some of them had suggested it takes a generational shift, right? Because those pilots that were educators after say World War II, the Vietnam era, they kind of had to learn on the fly in a sense, you know, pun intended basically. Whereas, you know, when they started to become instructors, they themselves saw the benefit of simulation-based technologies and it kind of, it, it you know, uh, snowballed from there in terms of becoming more prevalent and more powerful in the space. And I think that that's really important to kind of consider. And I think that is really relevant to everything that you all saying with regards to sharing the statistics, it really is a systems wide issue that we need to be looking at, right? And I think that in healthcare, you know, we've written an article before about how healthcare really blames the individual and in aviation, they blame the system, right? So mm -hmm. if there's a, if there's an error, something enabled for that error to take place. And so with healthcare, you have maybe a, a nurse who made a, a, a medication error, but that person was trained, educated, trained, recertified in a process ongoing. And somehow we've, we've enabled for a system that enables for that mistake to take place, right? And perhaps it is just this one-off individual, but I feel like a lot of the uh, the outcomes of that is, is that there's a lot of blame placed on the individual and that makes it harder for healthcare providers themselves to be honest and open with regards to errors, to be able to uh, not have the psychological stress of making mistakes and being on point so much that, you know, they know that there will be consequences for their actions that go above and beyond what is, you know, realistic for a problem that, you know, I think came out of the system itself. I remember, 
Um, one quick uh, note there was just like that there was a um, uh, an AED unit that had the charge button. The the charge button was uh, red and the power button was green. And so somebody hit green for go and turned off the AED. And now the patient has to wait another two minutes for the system to boot up, right? And so in a sense, it's like, well, that's a systems issue, right? That's not an, an individual. We're, we're, we're creating an, an environment of human factors that don't enable for us to have the greatest degree of su success because we're not looking at these things, I think, uh, primarily from that kind of a level as opposed to the individual and how do we keep training the individual <laughs> until they they get yeah. whatever is the craziness that's going on any other resources uh, that you would highly recommend i would love to just uh, make note of the book still not safe i'll put a link to it up in the chat room patient safety in the middle managing of american medicine uh, by robert wares who i believe unfortunately passed away uh, nor near the end of the book and kathleen sutcliffe who came in and helped to finish the book really awesome, uh, really deep into the conversation of where we are with patient safety right now and what we can do. Any other uh, resources, Donna, that, or books that, or other resources we should be taking a look at from your uh, uh, perspective? There's a ton, and <laughs> they're all on our website, sure. though. Uh, it just it depends on, on you know, the, obviously on the topic, but, um, you know, one thing I will say is that your audience has a really a really unique opportunity, I think, to be involved in patient safety because simulation helps to it helps to bring so many different concepts into an educational opportunity at the same time. And so if there is a way to um, to improve sustaining through incorporating education of all of the improvement activities that are happening in an organization, it's through simulation. So um, I would highly recommend that anybody that's out there that is responsible for simulation in an organization, look at how many different opportunities for education your frontline team has and, and see, what, see what you can do. How can you bring simulation to incorporate some, you know, and when, at one point I did this, I took no lie, 10 different educational opportunities and was able to put them together into one simulation. So, and, you know, so whatever you can do to make it easy on the front line, but at the same time to help to show the connection between all of the improvement work that's happening at the same time, I think it's going to go a really long way in patient safety. I totally agree. I think it's so important for everyone who really is in, engaged in simulation, whether they're new or, or at any phase, with, with their integration and their adoption of these technologies and methodologies, keep track of the data, keep track of what's going on, see what the outcomes are, you know, try to create a plan. And, and we say, start with the three things that, yeah, are the most critical, right? Or that you want every learner to, to be ready for. Maybe it's the three things that they need to all be ready for and really ready to go. And another three things that are rare, but really important to get right. You know, and I, that's where we always kind of recommend folks start. But these groups, wherever you're at, whether it be in your regional hospital area or looking at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation's kind of group, the LeapFrog group, ISQUA, there's going to be these resources where you can start to see what are the top areas for medical error to take place. You might be able to gain that from your own institution, partnering with schools in the, in the nearby area, starting to provide for that educational and training resources that will enable for outcomes that can be directly related. And I think starting with the stakeholders and as well, taking a look at it, that basic needs assessment and understanding, okay, where are the places where we could create a, camp, a campaign for you know, engagement or try to secure an, some initial funding to go after one key topic that I think is maybe in a sense low hanging fruit, but this is so important because it gives you an opportunity to showcase your ROI, right? What is, uh, what is the impact that has been created from the work that we're doing? And then that's how you kind of can, can gain that additional support for expanding the program. Once you have a, a solid win uh, under your belt, in a sense, you can kind of utilize that to, to go for the next heavyweight champion <laughs> opportunity of whatever it is that's facing your institution on the next level. Donna, thank you so much for this presentation. It's been really eye-opening. There are so many great resources and tools from the patient safety movement. You know, I know it's got an annual event normally, 
Um, we've got the virtual one coming up now. Folks really need to participate. There's so many great free resources. Um, there's simulation connected up and down throughout the, 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 the group. It's, it's mission, it's goals. Uh, between patient safety and simulation are just so aligned. So Donna, thank you so much. Any other uh, questions from anyone in the group right now? I don't see any in the, in the two chats. Um, anything you want to leave us with, Donna, to, uh, to move us forward at the end here? Uh, no, just another plug for Thursday, um, World Patient Safety Day. If you, yes. if you, if you, can't, you, know, if you can't join our, um, our event at 5 o'clock on Thursday, then at the very least, Take a picture of yourself, uh, support it in some, showing in some way support for patient safety, and then uh, share it with you, the hashtag Unite for Safe Care. Unite for safe, uh, safe Care. We've got Unite that in the chat room care. there. Awesome. And that's this Thursday, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. So hopefully everyone can join us there. Donna, thank you again so much. Thank you, everyone, for participating and joining. Thank you. I really appreciate it.